Hi. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. This is the last talk. We will have lightning talks, but this is the last full talk. Uh, we will have Anna here for those of you who already been in the panel talk. She is an amazing human being, and you have discovered it. If you were not here, you will discover it now. She works for Elastic, and she is, um, she is one of the directors of the BSF. So we are very, very grateful for you to be here. And she has a surprise. We don't know what she's going to talk about, but it's going to be super good. Give a good warm welcome to Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Mai. So my talk is going to be quite serious and very personal. So I thought I'd do something fun in the beginning. Also, you all had a really long day. You're probably falling asleep. So I want to wake you up. So yesterday, my childhood dream came true. I saw the Spice Girls at Wembley Stadium. <laughs> and we're going to do a little Spice Girls sing-along. <laughs> I'm serious. Lorena challenged me. She, she said I wouldn't do it. And I said, yes, I totally will. Um, some of you may know Jeff Triplett. He's also a fellow director of the Python Software Foundation. And we've been annoying him with all this Spice Girls stuff. So Lorena is going to record this just for Jeff. So please sing really, lo uh, really loud. We're going to do this a cappella without music, but I have the lyrics for you. So, OK. Are you ready? OK, come on. <laughs> Yo, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. So tell me what you want, what you really, really want. I'll, t I'll tell you what I want, want, what I really, really want. So tell me what you want, what you really, really want. So tell me what you want, what you really, really want. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to really, 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 If you want to be my lover, you got to get with my friends. Make it last forever. Friendship never ends. If you want to be my lover, you have got to give. Taking is too easy, but that's the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being crazy enough to do this with me. You probably think I'm totally crazy, but that's OK. All right. So this is going to be a bit of a weird transition. Um, but yeah, I'm going to talk about something really deeply personal. And um, there's some stuff in here that I've never even told, told my family. So I have one ask of you, be kind. If, there's, um, if, you, have nothing important, if you have nothing kind to say, then please don't say it. Um, so yeah, just be kind. Keep that in mind. So hi, I'm Anna. Um, a lot of you may know what I do in the Python Software Foundation or what I do for work, what I do in my free time. But hey, I'm mentally ill. Um, and that is something that a lot of you don't know about me. I started talking about it really openly um, a little while ago, but I didn't talk about this topic for a really, really long time. So I'm here to talk to you about the M word. And a lot of people have asked me today, what are you going to talk about? And I said, I'm not telling you. Because I didn't want to like, keep it a secret, but I was also really, ner I'm really nervous to give this talk. Um, and I came up with the title, The M Word, before Lloyd's Bank came up with the ads. Like You might have seen the ads that say the M word as in money. We're going to talk today about the M word as in mental illness. <laughs> Um, before I start, I do have to give a trigger warning. So this talk is going to be very serious. And I'm going to talk about things like depression, anxiety, self-harm, and suicidal thoughts. If any of this triggers any negative emotions in you or you don't want to hear about it, please leave the room right now or at any point during this talk. I don't want to make you feel bad. I don't want to cause any negative feelings in you. I won't be offended, I promise. I just want you to be OK. So please leave at any time if you need to. I also want to give a disclaimer. I'm not a doctor. I'm in no way a mental health professional. I'm not trained in therapy or psychology or medicine at all. I'm just someone who struggles and who has struggled for a really long time. So what I'm doing here is not giving any medical advice. I'm just sharing my story. Before I start, I want to give some numbers. Every seven years, there is a mental health survey done in England. And this last survey was done in 2016. And I took some of the results and put them up on slides. One in four people in the UK will experience a mental health problem each year. One in six people report experiencing a mental health problem in any given week. One in five people have had suicidal thoughts. 
one in 15 people have attempted suicide. Look around you. I don't know how many we are in this room, but one in 15. There's at least a couple of people here who might have attempted suicide. I thought about suicide. I knew exactly how I would do it. Think about those numbers. And this is my story. So I suffer from something called depression. Um, I pulled up the definition by the NHS, the National Health Services. Um, and it says that the symptoms of depression can be complex and vary widely between people. But as a general rule, if you're depressed, you feel sad, hopeless, and lose interest in things you used to enjoy. The symptoms persist for weeks or months and are bad enough to interfere with your work, social life, and family life. Depression is very different for everyone. There's manic depression, there's what I call regular depression. Again, I'm not a doctor. Um, the depression that I have is exactly as it's described here, like feelings of sadness, I can't do anything, everything seems really hard, whereas manic depression is kind of more up and down. But it's very personal, it's very different for everyone. I also suffer some, from something called anxiety. Um, anxiety is Anxiety is a feeling of unease, such as worry or fear, that can be mild or severe. Everyone has feelings of anxiety at some point in their life, but some people find it hard to control their worries. Their feelings of anxiety are more constant and can often affect their daily lives. I do want to point out that anxiety is not just fear. It's much, much, much deeper, and it's actually super crippling. Like I have this thing, my anxiety centers around losing people, and I get in these thought loops and I worry about my mom um, having an, a car accident and then I'm convinced that she's dying and then I call her several times and it's this thought loop that I cannot get out of until my mom picks up the phone. If you think about this, it's super crippling because your mind is spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and it's also really exhausting for your body. For me, anxiety is this, this weird feeling in my stomach that will not go away. So for a long time, my world looked like this. My world was really, really, really dark. I was always a child who worried a lot. Um, and I was always someone who was used to being successful in high school. And after high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. My parents, my parents' dream for me, and it still is a dream, is to, uh, is for, was for me to become a teacher for the longest time. My grandma, bless her heart, she's in heaven now, but she would clip out these like articles about teaching and she would tell me how good I am, but I knew that it's nothing that I wanted to do. Um, so I moved away, I went to university three hours away from home. Um, I also had a pretty bad relationship back then, but I didn't realize for a long time that it wasn't good for me. And I started developing this fear of losing people. It was my first time living away from home. I failed my first university exams, something that I wasn't uh, used to because I was blessed with a lot of success in high school. I would go home every weekend. I missed my boyfriend. I missed my mom. I wasn't making friends at university. And all of that didn't help. Uh, so in the end, I had to move back home because I was just sitting in my flat in uh, a city called Mannheim in Germany. And I was crying and like calling my mom and I had these thought loops and I didn't know what was going on. I literally, back then, I didn't know that I was experiencing anxiety because I had no idea what this feeling was. I couldn't put a name to it. Um, so I moved back home. I started therapy and back then therapy really saved my life. What I did back then is I also cut my arms. Um, it's something I'm not proud of. My boyfriend back then, he had a way of making me feel guilty about all sorts of things. And I had a lot of pain inside of me, pain that I didn't know how to deal with. And in a weird way, cutting myself made that pain better. So actually inflicting pain on myself made it better to feel that pain inside of me. Um, my mom doesn't know that I cut my arms. My family doesn't know that. Um, I'm getting emotional here because it's a very emotional topic. I'm not, I'm not proud of it, but I'm also not ashamed of it. Um, I admit it because I think it's important to admit. Um, I haven't done it in a long time, but I do get tattoos now because honestly, I still like the pain. Maybe I'm a little bit fucked up. Um, <laughs> but um, I also want to remind myself to never do this again, and I haven't done it since then. Um, I had suicidal thoughts. 
I knew exactly where I would crash my car on the highway. Every day I would drive to university and back home and I knew that exact spot where I would crash my car. Sometimes when my anxiety got really bad at night and I couldn't sleep, I would take drives and I would ponder, should I do it, should I not do it? Um, but I had it exactly planned out. Um, I didn't do it. Um, that's why I'm still here, thank God. Um, I somehow made it through that phase. I was about 22, 23, I'm now 29. I made it through that phase, but I was never fine. Um, I didn't live, I kind of existed. I managed to work more or less. I managed to have some relationships. I managed to have some connections. Um, I used to have jobs where I could work from home. So I had like a really messed up schedule. I would um, sleep all day and be up all night. I didn't want to be up. I didn't want to face reality. At one point, um, I lost my job, not because of mental health reasons, but for something else. And I was so ashamed to admit it. I was still living at home back then that I just locked myself in my room for two or three months. I'm not kidding you. I was sitting in this dark room. I couldn't stand the light. I didn't want to be around my family. I would only leave my room at night to eat or to go to the bathroom. Um, so that was my life. I tried to sleep as much as I could because I didn't want to face reality or I sometimes watch YouTube videos. But as I said, I was kind of existing and maybe hoping that I would die magically. Uh, my family thought that I was weird or lazy, but they never thought that anything else was really wrong with me. And my mom's a nurse. Um, I'm not blaming her here. Um, I just think that she honestly didn't know what was wrong with me or how to help me. My mom is someone who's very good with physical pain, but she's not as good with emotional pain. And I remember even texting her one day and saying, Mom, I really need help. Um, she did respond, but she didn't know how to help me. It started getting worse again in the beginning of 2018. I was dealing with another breakup. I hit rock bottom. Small things like taking a shower or making myself something to eat seemed impossible. I just couldn't do it. It wasn't that I was lazy. I literally physically couldn't do it. It was a challenge for me to even put a pizza in the oven or I wouldn't shower for like two weeks. Sorry, that sounds disgusting, but I, I just couldn't. Um, I would cry randomly, I had these thought loops, it got really bad and it affected my work, it affected my family life, it affected my social life. Um, I broke down crying in a team meeting and I couldn't really communicate what was wrong with me. Um, and then I broke down in front of a friend, her name is Melanie Crutchfield, she's also super involved in the Python community in the US and she um, shared her story with me so she was vulnerable with me which enabled me to be vulnerable with her and she um, told me, you know Anna, I really need, you really need help. And so I went back home from San Diego to Germany and she, Melanie kept lovingly sending me messages, checking on me and asking if I had gone to see um, a psychiatrist, if I had made that appointment. Um, and I did. Uh, so in Germany, our health system is pretty good. If you have mental health um, issues, you are legally allowed to see a psychiatrist within four weeks. They have to give you an appointment. So I went to see a psychiatrist. She did a first evaluation. Um, diagnosed me again with depression and anxiety. And I also had symptoms like light sensitivity or sound sensitivity. Like when people were eating around me, it sounded so amplified in my head, I couldn't stand it. Or I also couldn't stand being in the daylight. And so the psychiatrist told me that she thought there was an, a, a chemical imbalance in my brain going on. And she actually recommended medication this time. The first time I had gone to see, to see a therapist, uh, they did not recommend medication. So I started taking a medicine called sertraline, uh, which is a really common antidepressant. Um, my GP here in the UK prescribes it to me. I was really lucky because the med, first med that I tried worked for me. I just had to play with the dosage a little bit. I went from 50 milligrams to 75 and I'm now at 100 and I have taken 100 milligrams for a year. Um, but I know there are a lot of people who have to try several medications or even some people who cannot take medications because they cause several side effects or they just don't work for them. So I'm very, very lucky. 
I'm a really big proponent of medication. I have a thyroid illness, so I've been taking medication for my thyroid since I was 14 years old. My friend Melanie always says, if you have high blood pressure, there's like no question, yes, you're gonna take medicine. But there's still such a stigma around taking medication because your brain needs it. And I was one of those people, I was scared for a long time. I didn't wanna be that person. I didn't wanna be an addict. I just didn't wanna do it. I thought maybe my, all my issues will go away, magically disappear, and I could do it. But the truth is, there is a chemical imbalance in my brain, and my brain needs these pills to function. Took a pill this morning, I function like a normal person. After a few weeks of taking the meds, and this might sound really cheesy, but it really was like that, I uncovered that life really can be pretty good. It was like this dark veil was lifted from my face. And don't get me wrong, medication alone wasn't enough. Medication doesn't solve your problems. I made a lot of lifestyle changes. I worked really hard on myself. I got rid of toxic people in my life. It's not easy. Um, I worked on developing better habits. I moved to London. I worked on leaving the house every day. I now leave the house every single day and that's such a huge success for me because I was someone who couldn't. I would sit in my room for three months. Um, so I'm celebrating little successes and I'm actually really proud of that. Um, and I eventually started therapy in January, which has been helping me a ton. I'm really lucky that I have a private health insurance through my work, which covers uh, mental health services. So I see a wonderful therapist here in London and we do something called schema therapy. Uh, schema therapy, I don't know if you've heard it, heard of it, but it looks at certain patterns in your life and it tries to uncover why, why they always repeat themselves. Um, and then we try, on change, we try to work on changing these patterns. For me, there's something that I deal with, it's called emotional deprivation, which means that my parents didn't really give me the attention that I would have needed as a child. Not to blame them again, maybe they didn't know better, they had to work, et cetera. But it leads to me ending up in relationships with people who are not good for me. Um, so that's one thing that we deal with. Most days I'm fine now. Um, but I have some really bad days still. The truth is that mental illness never goes away. It's, I call it like this friend you don't want to have, but you have to be friends with it because you can't hate that part of yourself your whole life. It's, just, it's not just something like the cold or flu that will go away after two weeks. This is going to stick with me throughout my whole life. And there's going to be phases where it's going to be better and phases where it's going to be worse. Um, so I've, I'm still working on accepting this part of me because I'm a perfectionist, I, I'm a high goal-getter, and I don't like having this flaw. Um, what you see here is a quote by one of my favorite people, one of my heroes, Nelson Mandela. Actually, there's a statue of him on the South Bank, um, which has this quote on it, if you ever want to go see it. I walk by it sometimes on a Friday after work, and it makes me smile. Um, his struggle was the fight against apartheid, so totally different thing. I don't want to compare my struggle with his. But the point is that all of us struggle. And we need to somehow deal with these struggles. We sometimes think that there's perfect people, their life seems so perfect on social media, on Instagram, on Twitter, but they're not. There's something wrong with their lives too. And they struggle too. Life is not easy, but I do believe that it really can be a beautiful struggle if you try to make it that way. If I want you, I want you to take one thing away from this talk. No matter how much you're struggling, no matter how dark your world or the world of a loved one might seem right now, there is hope and there is help. It can get better. Here's how you can get help. These are UK re resources mostly. Um, you can call the NHS Mental Health Services, call your GP. Um, there are some other numbers you can call. If nothing else, talk to someone you trust or even talk to a stranger, but talk. Please keep in mind that getting help is not a weakness, it's a sign of strength. Asking for help is actually really damn hard. So if you're struggling, please do me a favor and reach out to someone, anyone. There's anonymous places where you can chat with people online, message someone on Twitter, 
reach out to someone. For a long time, I thought that I wasn't suffering enough, that it wasn't too bad, it would go away, I would be able to help myself. I was so ashamed. There were all these lies that I kept telling myself, and I was suffering in silence for 10 years. I'm now 29, it started when I was 19, 10 years, that's a really long time. That I, and I could have gotten help sooner. And there are some people who struggle that long and they don't make it. They commit suicide or something happens and they're not with us anymore. This is something that I saw in Clapham on my way to the tube. It says, vulnerability unites us. Um, in life, it's all about real connections. It's all about being vulnerable. I'm being very vulnerable with you right now in a room of 100 people or so. I encourage you to be more vulnerable. I, I promise it's worth it. Vulnerability is a way to make friends. It's a way to make re real human collections, uh, connections. People don't associate with perfect. They associate with flawed. So if you share a flaw about you, um, you can um, maybe expect or hope that someone else will share their flaws with you as well. Also remember that you don't have to suffer. This is something that Carol Willing, a friend, a dear friend from the Python community once told me, and I literally have it written down in my Trello, which is, which is what I use as my personal calendar, and I look at it every day. You don't have to suffer. As I said, I thought that I wasn't deserving of help, that it wasn't bad enough, but you don't have to suffer. So if you just in the slightest thing that you might need help, there might be something wrong with you or you're not feeling well, please do get help and just double check with your GP. They won't make you feel ridiculous. They won't shame you or anything. Just do um, go out and try to get help. And I promise that every single one in this room is struggling with something. You're not alone. This is some of my favorite resources. Um, I will tweet out these slides after my talk. Um, so Hope for the Day is an organization in the US um, that uh, deals with mental health. I have a few of these bracelets um, here that I would like to give to some of you. They say, it's OK uh, to not be OK, have hope. Um, so if you like one, please come see me. It's an awesome organization. And the Anthologies of Hope, po Hope podcast by my friend Rick Osofsky. We have the same last name, but we're not related. Uh, <laughs> Selfcare.tech Twitter account, Breaking Taboo Instagram, Creative Positivity Trello board. This is something where I collect uh, nice things that people have said to me, and I collect them in a Trello board, and I look at it on a rainy day when I need some motivation. I wrote a blog post about it. Also, send someone an open source happiness package. Um, every Friday, I send out between three and five happiness packets. It's a great way to brighten someone else's day, and it's a great way to make yourself feel happy by doing something nice for someone else. Um, I want you to write this down. Make a note on your phone, put a sticky note on your laptop, write it on your monitor, put it somewhere where you see it every day. And do me a favor and actually read it every single day until you believe it, because it's true. And now repeat after me. I am appreciated. I, I am enough. I matter. I am not alone. Please do actually write it down. It helps me. I have this as my email signature, so I'm forced to see it every time I, uh, I see an email. And pe people actually sometimes give me feedback that they like seeing it. Um, so yeah. Um, one of my favorite quotes is that in a world where you can be anything, be kind. Um, Mariana asked in the panel we just had, what does the world need more of? I didn't want to be cheesy, but I think it's kindness. And there's never enough kindness in the world. And also, this is something that I'm still learning, that I'm struggling with, is that no one is an asshole for no reason. So um, yeah, it's true. No one is a bad person just because they were born bad. No one is born bad. Life or circumstances have made them this way. So give everyone the kindness they deserve. They might actually be struggling with something that you don't know about. So this is all I have for you today. I won't be doing a Q&A on stage because this is super personal and I'm still nervous. Um, but I will be around um, after this talk. I might be around tomorrow morning. I'm not sure yet. But you can also tweet me. My Twitter is at ossanna16. Um, I'm always happy to chat and answer questions. Thank you for listening to me. And thank you for allowing me to be vulnerable with you.
Thank you. You're going to make me cry. Stop. <laughs> Thank you.